Matthew chapter 12, verses 46 today through verse 50. Matthew 12, verses 46 through 50. It's on the screen. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads in this fashion. While he, speaking of Jesus, yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother? And who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Amen. I want to talk to us today on the topic, O oh brother. Amen. O oh brother. Would you bow your heads with me a moment today? Father, we love you and we are so grateful, Lord, for the opportunity we have today to be in the house of God. We're so grateful, Lord, for the Word of God, the bread of life that brings to us, O oh God, instruction in righteousness, brings to us today, God, revelation, sound doctrine, brings to us today encouragement and inspiration. Master, the Word of God must go forth, and once again my body is going through some trial. And I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost like I have never needed the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch today, O oh God, my feeble lips. Help me, Lord, to deliver the word that you would have me to deliver at this hour, that it might be an encouragement and inspiration, that it might, O oh God, instruct the people of God in the way of righteousness and true holiness. Touch the ear of every hearer of those that are watching live at this moment, those who will later view the message by reason of the internet. Allow the word of God, Lord, not to fall upon our ears, but rather let it fall fruitfully upon the tablet of our heart. Lord, that it might be ingrained and that it might be engraved upon the tablet of our heart that we might live it and not merely hear it. Help us to receive revelation and understanding today. Let the spirit of revelation flow. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Praise God and amen. The Lord's mother and his brethren. This word brethren in the Greek literally means individuals with whom you share at least one parent. Jesus shared one parent with these individuals. We know according to the Word of God that James, the author of the book of James, was one of several brothers of Jesus Christ, or we would say today half-brothers. They shared a mother, Mary, but they did not share a father. Hallelujah. Because Jesus' father was God. And these others, their father was Joseph. Jesus and these men, Jesus and this woman, were part of a common family. They were part of a family unit. And they came and they were outside and the Lord was busy instructing and teaching his disciples and they came in and they said Lord your family I'm going to paraphrase your family your mother your brethren are outside and they want to talk to you 
And the Lord looked and he said, just who do you think my family is? He said, look around you. Do you see these men here? you see these people listening to me here? Anybody that does the will of my Father is my family. And it's really interesting. I will tell you, God doesn't do nothing by accident. I've, I've said this so many times. God does nothing by accident. We know that the Roman Catholic Church deifies and glorifies the mother of Jesus, Mary. But isn't it interesting that in this story, not only does the, the, the siblings, the half-siblings of the Lord, not only are they outside, but so is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Well, according to Catholic teaching, Jesus practically breaks his back trying to listen to Mother Mary. He, he nearly kills himself to make certain that he does whatever Mommy tells him to do. That's why to this day, Roman Catholic people pray to Mary because after all, she has such great sway over the Lord. No, she does not. No, she doesn't. He said, who's my brother? Who's my mother? He said These people said, whoever does the will of my father and listen, he said, that's my brethren, that's my brothers, that's my sisters, and he said, that's my mother. Interesting, isn't it? That he literally used the term mother. He said, they, anybody does the will of my father, that same person is on the same footing as my mother. Oh, hallelujah. Aren't you glad today to know that as a child of God, Mother Mary hadn't got any more sway with the Lord than you do. Hallelujah. If you do the will of the Father, if you do the will of God, like we sang in our song today, if I live a holy life, shun the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord will make a way for me. What does that mean? I'm going to earn heaven? No, no, no. You're not earning heaven. But honey, if you live a holy life, shun the wrong and do the right. I'm going to tell you something. God will direct you. God will guide you. God will lead you. And the Word of God said, He leads us in the path of righteousness. He leadeth me, Psalm 23 said, beside the still waters. Hallelujah! He'll lead you to the green pastures. He'll He'll lead you to blessing. He'll lead you to prosperity. Glory to God. You want to live a blessed life? Start living for God like you mean business and quit playing games. Tommy and I were talking just yesterday. We were driving around and doing things and We were talking and he said, you know, he said, isn't it amazing? I may shout a little because this thrills my soul. He said, isn't it amazing where we're at today compared to where we were some years back? Isn't it amazing that we're not in the same pit we always seem to used to be in, the financial pit? Isn't it amazing that God... Oh, hallelujah. That God has blessed us with nice cars and God's blessed us with a nice home and God has blessed us to wear nice clothes and God has blessed us to eat decent food and we don't, we don't need... You know, Red Lobster and, and, and all that fun stuff every day by any stretch. But you know what I'm saying? We're blessed. We're blessed beyond measure. I'm grateful to God. Oh, I'm grateful to the Lord for His blessings on me. But those blessings don't come because I come to church on Sunday and play church. Those blessings have come... Because if I'm going to live for God at all, I'm going to live for Him like I mean business. Hallelujah. I know what God asks of me. I know what the Lord would desire of me. I know what the will of the Father is for me. In my life, the will of the Father includes this ministry. There are many years that I struggled and struggled and struggled. And I really thought I was going to quit and give up because I just could not abide 
the sensation of failure. I felt every day like a massive failure. Every Sunday I'd come to church and there'd be a couple of people there, a handful of people there, and my God, we couldn't get over that number of people. And week after week, month after month, year after year, honey, when I was pestering my early churches in the mainstream, my churches grew by leaps and bounds. If we got somebody to walk through the door and visit, I knew we had a, a member. I knew we did. We, I honestly, the, the percentage of people who visited our church and stayed and became members, and I mean literally became tithe-paying church members, was so high that it literally boggled the mind of my overseers in the denomination that I was in. My first overseer, G.J. Chandler, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, Brother Chandler told me, he said, Brother Charles, I've never seen anything like it. He said, I've never seen people, I've never seen a church grow like your church has grown. I've never seen people as devoted to their pastor and as committed to the vision of their church. He said, your people are on fire. They are, they love the vision that their pastor has, and they're doing everything in their power to make that vision a reality. I've been in affirming ministry now since 1993. And if I had a building that could hold 100 people, I still can't fill a building. I want to tell you something, folks. When you grew up the way I grew up, when you grew up being told every day of your life what a failure you were, what a flop you were, what, you were never going to amount to nothing, you, you're, you're just worthless and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's all I ever heard from my father. Those words devastated my brothers. I'm not saying by any stretch of the imagination that they didn't have a great impact on me because they did. To this day, I wrestle with demons. Every day of my life, I wrestle with demons. Because those words and those thoughts just echo in my mind. The enemy uses them against me. There were so many times, Tommy knows, that I thought I was going to quit and just give up. I just was tired. I couldn't do this anymore. I felt like such a washout and such a failure. We couldn't get support to get anything done. We couldn't get the support to do anything. And I had a vision, and my God, we would try to open a thrift shop to try to generate some money so we could do some of the things I had a vision to do. And the only person that would work that thrift shop was me. And on weekends, poor Tommy, he worked all week long at the bank, and then on weekends he'd come and help me at the thrift shop on Saturday. We were closed, of course, on Sunday. I was putting in 40 to 60 hours a week at the thrift shop. Why? So we'd have the money to have a place to worship. I was working my butt. I wasn't making a dime from doing what I was doing. Everything I was doing, I was doing for the work of God. I was trying to get... So we did that for a while. That didn't pan out because eventually I'd either get worn out or some circumstance. Then we tried to open a bookstore. An outreach center we had a coffee shop we had the library we had the just like I had in New York City in New York City it was phenomenally successful down here forget about it couldn't get it to fly for all the money in the world part of that is the fault of the internet people don't buy you know hard copy books anymore like they used to and I understand that I'm not I'm not faulting anybody but boy I'm telling you I put in more hours and more labor and more work than any pastor I've ever known in my life. Trying to help LGBT people especially, not only, but especially to understand that God loves them, He understands them, and they are on equal footing with any non-LGBT Christian or believer we're all sinners saved by grace. We're all today in the same exact boat, whether you're straight or gay. Doesn't matter whether you're transgendered or you're the butchest man or the 
uh, softest woman that ever walked the face of the earth, honey. We are all... The Word of God said that God has concluded us all under sin. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not a Christian on this planet that is without sin. And the Christians who try to tell you you can't serve God because of who you are, I got news for you, honey. Read your newspaper. Look at what old Jerry Falwell Jr. has been up to. Everybody's got sin in their life. The difference is uh, your sin may not be my sin. My sin may not be your sin, but you still got sin, baby. And there's not going to be one soul in heaven because they were straight rather than gay. No, the only people in heaven are going to be there because they obeyed and believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, period. End of the story. That's what is required. That is what is necessary. You can twist and pervert it and pollute it all you want to. That is the Word of God. If you can believe and obey this glorious message, you can be saved. Period. I'm grateful for my Christian family. I'm grateful for my family in the church. You know, when Jesus said, those that do the will of my Father, that's my brethren, that's my brothers, that's my sisters, that's my mother. I love my Christian family. I love believers. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to do everything perfect. They're my brethren. I love them. We share a parent together. Amen. Amen. In our case, we share God. Hallelujah. God is our Father. And you are my brother. You are my sister. I've had ladies in the church that took me under their wing when I came to Texas as a teenager. And they served as a surrogate mom to me. And I'm grateful for them. I've had men in the church. Brother Freeman Sensabaugh. The Riverside Church of God. Bless his heart. I don't know why, because I don't see myself as being all that lovable a person. I really don't. I, I know I know for a fact I have an unusual personality. I know for a fact I can be an odd duck. So nobody has to tell me. I know that. But Brother Freeman Sensible, somehow or another, he just fell in love with me and took me under his wing, and he became a, a surrogate dad to me. And, oh, I'm telling you, I thank God for those brothers in the church that were surrogate dads because my own dad was a holy terror but to have a man in the church that loved me and just thought the world of me and could tell me brother you know you're you do this well and you do that well and, and you can accomplish and you can achieve I never heard them words coming out of an adult man's mouth unless it was somebody in the church I'm going to tell you something. There's something to be said for church family. It's sad when Christians don't value and appreciate church family. It's sad when God's people allow themselves so easily to be divided and so easily to be separated from church family. See, I don't know about you, but... I have friends that I love and there are areas that we disagree in so vehemently and I mean <laughs> we're on completely opposite ends of the spectrum. I attended uh, a semester of college at the Central Connecticut State University in New Britain, Connecticut and just before I moved to New York, or else I would have continued there, and I switched over to another university in uh, Brooklyn. And while I was at that college in Connecticut, I met a young lady from Scotland. Her name's Fiona. She's a friend of mine to this day. We're connected on Facebook. I love this girl to death. I absolutely love her to death. You want to know what was funny? When I met her, she was a rabid animal rights activist. 
she wouldn't, man, I mean to tell you, she wouldn't eat meat, she wouldn't wear leather, she wouldn't nothing. Had it, if, if it had an animal involved in it, she was against it. When PETA sent their wagon, you know, to the college, they had their displays in it about animal testing and drug testing and uh, cosmetic testing on animals. So Fiona brought me to it and wanted me to see it, and I went and looked. Now, had it not been Fiona, for Fiona, I probably would have never seen all that, and I would have never learned some of the things I learned. And it was heartbreaking because I am an animal lover. I'm absolutely an animal lover. Fiona was a socialist. I was a Reagan Republican at the time. She couldn't stand Ronald Reagan. Anything had to do with Ronald Reagan, she'd just about throw up. She, she looked at him the way that I look at this demon in the White House today, Donald Trump. I mean, she looked at Ronald Reagan with all the, you know, she, oh, he was detestable to her. She's an animal rights activist. She's a vegetarian. She's a socialist. She's as liberal as they come. I'm the exact opposite. She don't want to know nothing about God, don't want to know nothing about religion, bless her heart. Her mom was a devout Christian, a part of the Church of Scotland, and I eventually got to go to Scotland and I met her mom. I thought her mom was terrific. Fiona about swallowing her teeth because her mom and I got along so great. And it was so funny because, like I said, Fiona and I are just completely opposite people. You know what? We love each other to death. I'd jump in front of a train for that girl, and I mean that with every ounce of my being. I love that girl to death. We talked about issues, we talked, we debated, we disagreed, we argued, and we never stopped respecting one another. You know why? Because you don't have to demonize people, you don't have to hate people. You don't have to be mean-spirited to people just because they come from a different perspective than you. I could understand her perspective. I could understand the, the vantage point, the viewpoint she was coming from. Whether or not I agreed with it, it, it that was you know, irrelevant. But I understood it. There were changes that I made because Fiona was in my life. Every year I used to have a tradition years ago. I used to love them leather gloves that had the uh, fur lining inside of them, you know. The rabbit fur lining. Oh, I used to love those. And I would go just about every winter. I'd go buy me a new pair of those. There were some stores in Connecticut where I grew up. G. Fox sold them, you know. Macy sold them. And I'd go and get me, and I love, boy, you put them on, and oh, that rabbit fur. Oh, I hope Fiona's not watching right now. <laughs> those clubs man oh they were wonderful right do you know what after I met Fiona and after Fiona exposed me to some things I stopped buying those clubs I started buying isotoners instead you know whole and their cloth you know their fabric and what have you I liked them very much but they were entirely different than the others but you see, by letting her into my life and exposing myself to her perspective and her thinking and some of her arguments on things, it changed the way I saw a lot of things. Took me a lot of years, but many years later I was able to look back at the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Fiona partly came over to my side and years later she said, I had to do a, pro a project in school and I chose to do it on Ronald Reagan. Of course, she's ready to tear him up, you know. She said, but I found out, she said, I realized why he was so popular. I realized why uh, the American people reacted to him the way he did, you know, some of the things. And so she kind of understood my perspective better later. And then, don't you know, I understood her perspective better later. All it took was time. We got people in church get mad at the preacher and they disappear and we never see them again over some of the stupidest issues. We're brethren. We're family. We're brothers. We share the same father. 
I got news for you. I've got a brother. I've got two brothers. I'm the oldest of three. I've got two brothers. And there are some things that I would never ask my brother to do for me. That Mina don't love me. I just know his personality. I know, you know, what he does. And I know how he acts. And I just would never ask, you know, I would never ask certain family members to do certain things because I know that it would lead to problems or there'd be issues, you know, or something, whatever the case might be. Well, I got news for you. Same thing's true in the church. There are people in the church. I know that if I ask them to do certain things for me that without fail, I hate to say it, but without fail, there's going to be drama. Without fail, there's going to be something come up. And I tend to be very plain spoken. I tend to speak my mind, and some people love it, some people hate it, probably more hate it than love it. I've told people, I said, I'll never ask you to do this particular favor for me again. Doesn't mean I don't love you. Doesn't mean I can't get along with you. Doesn't mean I want you out of my life. But it means that I've had enough experience with you to know that it probably is better if I not ask you to do this. Do you follow what I'm saying? But see, I, I would do the same thing with my family. I would utter those same identical words to my blood brother. Say, Michael, I would never in the world ask you to do this for me. I would never ask you to do this particular thing because I know how he is and I know it would turn into something that I would not be comfortable with. The Word of God declares in Proverbs 18, verse 24, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. I looked at this passage and I was thinking about it and I said, you know, that is so true. I've I've had friends over the years that I would do things for that I wouldn't do for my own family members, my own brothers. There are friends that I would trust more than I trust my own brother. There are friends that I have that uh, I would ask to do things that I wouldn't ask my own brother to do. You follow what I'm saying? Uh, and then I thought about that for a moment and I said, you know, it's interesting, but really the reasons for that are kind of interesting because when your blood, when you're part of a family unit, there are dynamics that come into play that don't play when you're friends with somebody. You've heard the term sibling rivalry. Man, I'm going to tell you, Tommy's an only child. He doesn't know how lucky he is in some regards. Because I was the oldest of three when my second brother was born. That kid wanted to be the center of attention 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. He didn't care what he had to do to get there, honey. He would kill somebody, shoot somebody, whatever he had to do so long as he had your attention. You put him in a room with 30 people and he will talk your ears off and every word he says is going to be about himself. What he owns, what he does, his hobbies, his experiences in life, every word is going to be about himself. Try to shut him up to listen to somebody tell them about themselves. And he might be able to hold back for a few minutes, but then he's going to turn the conversation right back. Growing up as a kid, I was terrified of my father. Absolutely terrified. If my mother left the room, I had to leave the room right behind her because I was terrified to be alone in a room with my dad. Won't go into all the details of that. My little brother, Michael, bless his heart, when he was a kid, uh, 
Tommy, my father, come home from work. Michael ran to him. He would wrap his arms around my father's calf and he would sit on his foot and wrap his legs around my father's ankle and my father would be walking like this, you know, dragging Michael along when he was just two years old, three years old. The first house my parents owned. I would have never done that for a million dollars. I could have never done that. But you know, brothers a lot of times can be in competition with one another. They're always trying to vie for attention. They're always trying to prove themselves to mom and dad. They're always trying to one-up one another. They're always trying to be better than the other. You know, uh, they always want to have bigger bragging rights. You buy one car, they buy another. I've got siblings that I can buy a new car and I won't even get a congratulations off their lips because they'll be burning with envy. That's sad. Now, they come to me and they show me or they tell me they bought a new car and I'm, oh, congratulations, that's great, oh, that's nice, you know, and I'll play it up and everything because I'm not in competition with them, but I'm the oldest and a lot of times, family order, where you're found in the family lineup, makes a big difference, you know. And all of a sudden, well, they're not the oldest, so they're always trying to catch up with Big Brother. They're always trying to outshine Big Brother and look big, bigger and better than Big Brother. So, you wonder why in the church these things also happen. Yeah, you'll find sibling rivalry in the church. You'll find folks in the church seem like they're in competition with everybody or in competition with the other guy. It happens. That's part of family life. That's part of being family. But I got friends that they're not in competition with me. I can tell them anything and they're happy for me. Everything I tell them, they're happy for. They're not the least bit in competition. They're not the least bit vying for anybody's attention. Do you follow what I'm saying? There are friends that sticketh closer than a brother. Jesus is often described as a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We sang the song today, and I must confess it was on purpose. What a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus also made a similar comment to that which he made today in Matthew 12. He said, If you keep my commandments, then you're my friends. Isn't that funny? He said, Those that do the Father's will are his brother and sister and mother. Proverbs 18, verse 24 said, One who has unreliable friends soon cometh to ruin. But there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's the NIV version of what I read to you a moment ago from the King James. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. Oh, isn't that the truth? But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. In Matthew chapter 23, verse, verses number 8 and 9, Jesus said, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. And that's why we're brethren, because we share one father. See, to be brethren, you have to have at least one parent that you share. Amen? Let me tell you the wonderful mystery, oh brother. Let me tell you the wonderful mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our father which is in heaven, is a spirit. The Word of God says God is a spirit. God cannot be defined, nor can the Father be defined 
or described as a person. It's absurd. I realize the Nicene Council in 325 AD decided in their great wisdom to describe God as being one God in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's a crock of nonsense. It's garbage. You cannot describe God as a person. The word person doesn't even begin to apply to God. God is a spirit. The Word of God tells us plainly, God is a spirit. Whenever you read the word Father in the Word of God, you are not describing a person. You are describing the spirit of God. You're describing the Creator, the Spirit. The Word of God said in the beginning that the Spirit of the Lord was over the face of the deep. Amen? God is a Spirit. He occupies all of space and all of time. There is nothing that can contain Him. So to describe Him as a person is insanity. But our Father, the Spirit that gave birth to us, the Spirit that created us, the Spirit that then caused us to experience new life in Jesus Christ. Listen to this now. That Spirit manifested itself as a human being. In the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah said his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's what the Old Testament prophet said of Jesus. But the angel told Mary and the angel told Joseph, He shall be called, what? The Son of God. Why is this man called the Son of God? Because he was born of a woman. He was physically born of a woman. That woman made the claim and that man continued to make the claim throughout his entire life that she knew no man. He had no father but the Spirit of God. Am I telling the truth? Here's the mystery of oneness. Here's the mystery of us apostolic Pentecostal people. Here's the wonderful truth that we celebrate today. Here's the one God, Jesus name, doctrine that we preach. Our Father became our brother. He manifested himself as our brother so that he could share our experience. Oh, glory. He could share our experience. Listen to me, children. As sons. Had he come to earth to be the father? And change the fact he was the father. But had he manifested himself as the father, then he could have never identified with us who were to become his sons and his daughters. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? In order to understand us, he had to manifest himself differently than the father. He had to manifest himself as something less, as something smaller, as something simpler, as something that we could then look at and understand and identify with. He said, I'm calling these people to become my children. Therefore, I have to become my child. So they then have, listen to me now, an older brother. Oh, hallelujah to lead the way, to set the example. How do I please daddy? What makes daddy happy? Well, just look at older brother. 
Why? Because everything he does pleases Daddy. Everything he does makes Daddy happy. If you want to know how to make Daddy happy, just do things the way older brother does. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That's why God manifested himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul said, For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Our Father became our brother. And this is why the Word of God calls Him the firstborn. In Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 31, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed, listen, to the image of his Son. So what is God's purpose for us? What is God's plan for us? His plan is to cause us to be conformed to the image of Christ, his Son. Well, if we're conformed to the image of his Son... Would that not then make us a son? Yes, it would. But listen. That he, meaning Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brethren. <laughs> our father became our oldest brother. He became the firstborn. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them also, uh, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Oh, brother. I think about this, and I'm almost done today. I think about this, and I apologize if my preaching is a little off. Like I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going through some real discomfort, I hate to tell you at the moment. Our father became our eldest brother. We didn't know we had an older brother. We didn't know we had an eldest brother. All of a sudden, one day, he appeared on the scene, and Dad said, this is my firstborn. I want you to follow his example. I want you to do things the way he does things. Because if you do things the way he does things and, and you follow his example, one of these days I'm going to take you and I'm literally going to transform you so that you and he are just alike. He didn't tell us that this was himself. He just told us that this was his firstborn. But he knew. He knew who he was. He knew who he was. When Philip said, Lord, we can believe if you just show us the Father. Jesus looked at Philip and said, Philip, how long have I been with you? And yet you still say to me, show us the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yet you still ask me, show us the Father. He knew who he was. We didn't know who he was. We called him the Son because all we could identify with was a man. He was the same as we were. If he had appeared as a spiritual being, you know, with quote-unquote magic powers, then we would have understood him to be God. We would have understood him to be the Father. But the Word of God said... Let this might be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, as God, he understood, I could easily go to earth as God and, and be the same as God. However, it says, instead, he humbled himself, took upon, him for, took upon himself the form of a servant. Humbled himself became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Our Father manifested Himself 
as our eldest brother. So we'd have an example to follow. So we would know how to be good sons. So we would know how to do things the way Daddy wants us to do things. But Daddy, to show us that, He showed us Himself. Hallelujah. How do you like that? He came to earth and He revealed Himself to us in the person of that one that we look at and we see as the eldest son. And the Bible calls Him the firstborn, but He is the firstborn, listen to me now carefully, according to the Word of God, He is the firstborn in this manner. He is the firstborn from the dead. It has nothing to do with Him being first created by God. It has to do with the fact that He was the first child of God, as it were, to ever be resurrected from the dead. He was resurrected from the dead for the purpose of our then being able to be resurrected from the dead, to follow in His footsteps. We will get to heaven. The Word of God said that Jesus spoke from heaven and said, He that overcometh, He said, I will be their father. Or, or they will be my sons and I will be their God. But you see, in order for us to get there, we needed that eldest brother. Hallelujah. We needed that older brother to show us the way. God manifested Himself in human form so that He could demonstrate and illustrate and expound for us the ways of the Father. Over and over again, He said to us, I don't do anything except the Father tells me. I don't say anything except the Father speaks to me about it. Well, what was he saying? That one person was speaking to another? No, friend. God is a spirit. The Word of God tells us that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself. What does that mean? One person was in another person? No. It means the Spirit of God was in the flesh. God manifested Himself in the flesh. That's all it means. Externally, He was man. Internally, He was God. Spiritually, He was God. Physically, He was the Son of God. Hallelujah. Are you following this at all today? Isn't it incredible when you think, can you imagine if your dad had the ability to kind of take a little part of himself and kind of pull it away and, and mold an image that looks a lot like himself but resembles you a lot more, young, school age. And all of a sudden you find out, oh, I've, I've got an older brother. And your dad's sitting there saying, yeah, you got, you got an older brother right there. Now he's going to go to school with you and he's going to live life with you and he's going to see how you live and you're going to see how he lives. Oh my goodness. All of a sudden your father would have a very different perspective and a very different understanding of your life, wouldn't he? He'd have a whole different understanding of what it's like to be a teenager going to school, to high school. He'd have a whole different understanding of what it's like uh, to be a child who has to leave mommy's arms and go into the kindergarten alone. He'd have a whole different understanding of what it feels like to reach eighth grade and graduate and be going into high school and then to graduate high school. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Oh, your father would have a whole different perspective because when he was growing up, things didn't work the way they work for you and I today. The, your parents didn't experience things the same way. We've got issues in high schools and in schools today that our parents never had to deal with. I've said many times, I thank God I grew up and left school long before the internet age because with all this internet bullying and stuff, 
I used to get bullied something awful in school. I can only imagine how much worse it would have been if I had had to go through all that. But see, I never had to go through all that. So even though I sort of kind of understand it, I can't really understand it because I haven't had to live it. But our Father did. He lived our experience as sons and daughters of God. And He said, everybody that does the will of the Father that's my mother, that's my brother, that's my sister. Those are my siblings right there. Those are all my siblings right there. I'm the firstborn. I'm the eldest. But you all are my siblings. Don't call anybody your master. You have one master, and that is who? Christ. Notice he didn't say God or the Father, you know. He used the term Christ referring to himself. He says, no. When you want to know who to follow, I'm the guy you follow. When you want to know example to follow, I'm the example to follow. When you want to know the rules to live by, I'm the one that gives you the rules to live by. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Oh, brother, I want to tell you today, it excites me to know that God went to such incredible, wonderful lengths to understand us and to be understood by us. Salvation for lost humanity was not cheap. It came at a tremendous price. But our God, our Father, became our brother so that we all could be today the sons and daughters of God. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?